morning, everybody, and welcome to the call. Thank you for joining me today. My name's uh, Peter Fernandez. I'm a principal developer advocate with your Zero Product Unit um, here at Okta. Uh, and today I am joined by my colleagues Tim and Pradeepa. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me uh, very quickly uh, so you know who I am, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues. They're going to tell you a little bit about themselves. Basically, I'm an architect, consultant, engineer. I have more than 30 years experience of developing software and working in the industry. Um, and when I'm not helping teams with the complexities and vagaries of securing software and security systems and security principles, uh, you can usually find me engaged in either acting or directing a show at my local theatre. That's a little bit about me. I'm going to hand over to Tim. Tim's going to tell you a little bit about himself. Hi all, yeah, good morning everyone. I'm Tim, I'm the tech lead for AWS in EMEA. I'm for over three years now with Okta and for over 10 years in the identity space. When I'm not working, um, you can find me chasing my big dream to travel to every country in the world. So far, I've been to over 100 countries and I hand it over to Pratipa. Uh, I'm Pradeepa, I'm a staff developer advocate at Okta for the Odzil product. Uh, I've around around 15 years of experience uh, developing softwares and architecting solutions. Uh, this is my first year at Okta. Uh, so when I'm not working, I usually find me reading and going for an outdoor walk, uh, but that has changed a lot. After I had my twin daughters last year, mostly I don't have any free time. And if I find free time, I'm usually sleeping. Uh, that's all about me. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the introduction. Thank you, Pradeepa. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just before we start, uh, we've got a little uh, kind of terminology slide here. We're going to explain a lot of these things as we go through the presentation, but this one's just here for a refresher for those folks who uh, watch the video afterwards and also who might look at the slide deck as well. So it's a little bit about the terminology and a little bit of explanation on there. And if we could get to the next slide, please, Pradeepa. Uh, then we're going to do, this is the agenda for today. So you're going to get a little bit of um, information here about what's coming up. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tim, who's going to take us through our first section of what is Auth0. Yeah, fantastic. So what is Auth0? Well, we've all heard the expression that every company is a software company. But with the explosion of like products and services, um, in reality, every company is becoming an experience company. And we as a consumer, we want to have an experience like with buying on Amazon or watching a movie on Netflix. So organizations want to differentiate the products that they develop and the services that they provide. So it all comes down to user experience. And this is where Authero as a cloud platform to manage the user identities comes into play. Our goal with the Authero platform is to optimize digital experiences by creating frictionless, contextualized, and secured user journeys while providing the developers a flexible and very easy to use platform that is extensible and secure. On the next slide, we can see how the high-level architecture of Authero looks like. The user journey starts on the right-hand side where we have the user identity. And typically you have one or multiple web portals, smartphone applications, or different ways to allow your end users to use your services and products. Authero is the central part, what we can see with the universal login. So Authero as a cloud platform provides you a single sign-on experience across those different portals. This is very important to improve the user experience and with the latest browser limitations of the blocking of like cross-site cookies and so on, it's super important to have this externalized login page. 
the universal login what we what we provide is an hosted login and it provides a lot of features and functionality that you can easily enable and adopt to provide this frictionless user experience for all your products. First of all, we provide different ways of authenticating the user. So you probably know that um, a lot of websites offering the sign in with username and password. And that is okay, but it adds a lot of friction. And by using the latest methods such as uh, passwordless login, so we send an ODP to an email or an SMS to the end user, lowers already the friction. Um, if you have some sensitive applications, you can also easily enable additional factors such as the authentication with face ID, touch ID, or some other biometric factors. When we think about the user login and the way users register themselves for applications, then it's a really bad user experience when you have a large list of fields where they have to provide like a username, um, first name, last name, email address, and so on. For that reason, Othero provides out of the box over 60 pre-built logins with social identity provider. Social identity providers is the sign in with like Google, sign in with Apple, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. The advantage of using them is that the sign-in is frictionless. You don't have to provide any password. On top of that, you also get additional information about the user because those external social identity providers, they already have basic information about the user. As I said, first name, last name, you could also get like the date they are birth uh, and so on and so forth. When we think about enterprise applications, then those users typically live in their identity provider of those enterprises. And we make it very, very easy to connect to your existing enterprise identity provider, such as Okta, Azure AD, Ping, and so on. Within this identity platform of Authero, there is tons of data generated. For that reason, we have a lot of built-in functionalities to stream those log files to external services from AWS. But there is also a way to easily migrate your existing users if they are stored in some external databases or some other identity solutions. What we want to take a closer look in the next slide is how the Authero authentication pipeline works. And this is the big differentiator from the Authero platform to all the other identity platforms that you can find on the market. On the right hand side, on the sorry, on the left hand side, you, you can see that you have the application that you want to integrate with our platform. And on the right hand side is where the user is authenticated and gets his ID and access token. Um, how you can use those tokens, um, we will tell you in the next section of this webinar. But first, let's take a closer look on the authentication pipeline. So you can see that in the blue color, there is different extension points. Those extension points we call Authero Actions. Authero Actions are pieces of code which you can write to customize the user journey. Um, those pieces of code, the Authero actions are written in JavaScript. You can think of them like an Amazon Lambda and they allow you to completely customize the way the user authenticates himself, but also the way how you enrich the information of the user. Imagine you have an application which is protecting some access to insurances. And by enriching the token with information about, let's say the insurances a user has, it's much, much easier to then consume the ID and the access token that you get at the end of the flow. The way the Authero 
works is that we have a lot built as part of the pipeline, but it's also powerful enough to redirect to some external websites before you are completely authenticated. Why do you need that? Well, if you want to request something such as terms of services, or you want to enrich the user profile by prompting for additional information, um, then we provide a flexibility to add that as part of the sign-in process. So you can completely delegate all the identity-related topics to Othero. In the orange color, we can also see that there is a marketplace. The marketplace provides pre-built integrations, which you can literally take, track, and drop into our authentication pipeline. To provide you a good example is, um, imagine you have an online shop and you want to sell alcohol. Um, you're only allowed to sell alcohol when um, the user is over 18. So you need an identity proving. And by using our marketplace and pre-built integrations for identity proving, you can easily add it into our authentication pipeline and you don't have to touch your existing application because you can completely delegate it and make sure that the user is authenticated at the age of 18 or older before we actually allow the access to your application. On the next slide, we can see an overview about the Authero ecosystem and all the integrations that we have. Um, there's, as I said, tons of pre-built integrations with social identity provider. Why is it important to have those pre-built integrations? Well, it allows you to try, the, to try out those integrations faster. And it also increases the time of delivering more features in a short period of time, because you don't have to come up by yourself and creating all those integrations. For a lot of the features, it's basically a switch of a button to enable and try them out. On the next slide, we can see that there are even more complicated use cases when we think about SAS identities. SAS identities is when you build your own SAS service like Confluence and Jira, and you want to provide for each of your SAS customers, which have their own tenant and sign and user experience that is frictionless. And in this picture, we can see different ways on how the sign and flow of such a SaaS service can look like. On the right hand side, we can see that you have an sign in mask where the end user knows already the tenant name. But you can also start the sign in journey by just providing the email address of the end user. And then in the middle section, Authero can customize per SAS or per tenant how the sign -in experience looks like with a custom logo, color, and the way the user authenticate. So in the first one, you can see they can sign in with a username, which is managed completely on the Authero platform. But that organization also allows the sign in with GitHub, whereas the other ones only saw, allow the sign in with, let's say, SID and so on and so forth. Um, the screens that you can see here are um, hosted by the Authero platform. That means you can completely delegate that logic and heavy lifting and a large customer that's, that's actually um, using Authero for that purpose is Jira and Confluence. So every time you sign in to an Atlassian service, Authero is running in the background to make sure that we provide this frictionless user experience. On the next slide, we can see that most people think about a platform like Authero, that it's just a login box. And when you build your own application, and if you use any of those SaaS services, yes, what you see as an end user, it's a simple login box. And in reality, there is even more components which you need. So what you typically have is sign in with username and password, 
and some basic capabilities to have a process to reset your own password. But in the next step, you want to reach a bigger audience. So that means you introduce the sign in with social logins. And for that purpose, you also have an increase of the users, but it means you also have to figure out a better way on how to support all those users. And with Authero, you have one central store with all the user identities. And we have pre-built components that allow your help desk to easily manage those users. Um, with the new way of attracting more users, um, you get more traction on the platform. That means you have more fake accounts, you have bot attacks. And for that reason, you have to introduce some new mechanisms to fight them. So you have to verify the email. You need an email server that is scaling. You need some bot protection capabilities. You potentially add a capture if there is some more risks detected. And then in the next step, you want to improve the user journey to reach even more people. So you want to take the information that you get from the users and provide them to downstream systems, such as your marketing system, CRM systems. So organizations want to have this 360 degree view about their customers. And then last but not least, you want to expand their integration of a central identity platform into all your applications. That means it's not just a web application or a smartphone application that you start with, but you want to have one central login experience across the whole application stack that you have. May it be built or some organizations which you acquire to widen your offering. And for that reason, you get even more challenges. And you can see that with the full picture, custom identity is not just a login box. There's so many different components which you need and you can build part of that, but it takes months, even for organizations, years to build all those components. You have to maintain the components. You need some senior developers, some very experienced people who can deal with this complexity of, of security. You need pen test teams to make sure that what you have developed is also built in a secure way. So tons of challenges. And what we see is that organizations use a platform like Authero to delegate all the complex complexity into a ready-to-use solution so they can focus on their core product and they don't have to deal with that. And with that, I want to hand it over to Pratipa to tell you more on how you can authorize APIs. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much. That was a very informative session. So whenever you hear for zero, just remember the last slide, how many things that are going and then, you know, uh, what are the things that are uh, behind the screens uh, of zero does, the components that uh, helps to protect our day-to-day uh, -day applications. So let's get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, so the meat of the webinar is like securing the Amazon API gateway using Auth0. So before we get started, I just want to put a big text, like does everybody know what is an API means? Like, what does it mean? Uh, API uh, is nothing but uh, it's a, a application programming interface. Uh, it's a set of protocols that enable uh, communication between different software components. So these software components doesn't have to be of the same uh, uh, system. For example, like uh, you, you have an API gateway, but the components that are talking to the API does not necessarily be the same from uh, the same application. So uh, API just stands in the middle of uh, the actual data and uh, the client request and response. Uh, 
I'm sure most of you are familiar with Gmail. So I just took the basic uh, uh, Gmail API. So we have to understand like in, uh, if you are talking about a REST API, there are uh, some basic components like irrespective of any API, it, uh, it's a Google or Twitter, whatever, you'll have some base URL and then you have a resource. And then there is a method, whether it's a get or post. So in this case, uh, let's say you wanted to get the profile, use a profile. Uh, the base URL is gmail.googleapace.com. And then uh, you have a resource URL uh, uh, to get uh, the particular information. So Gmail v1 users is called a resource path. And then it defines what method you have to use to get that particular information. So in here, it's like a HTTP get request. Uh, suppose you wanted to uh, update some information like watch or stop, then uh, you just have to uh, make a post call. So this is uh, basically an API. Um, so what is Amazon API Gateway? Amazon API Gateway provides um, uh, a solution like to create uh, REST APIs. Uh, it can you can also create other APIs as well, but uh, uh, just for the sake of simplicity, uh, since we are going to secure the REST API, uh, so Amazon API Gateway provides a, a, a solution to procreate, publish, maintain, and secure APIs at any scale. Uh, like as you look at uh, look at uh, the system, uh, the architecture, uh, I took it from the AWS. So it, this gives you a complete overview of how the API Gateway looks like. You have your uh, web and mobile applications, IoT devices, and any other on-premises applications. As I mentioned, like these applications does not necessarily have to be from the same uh, system. So uh, these are all distributed and they are all talking to the API Gateway. The API Gateway uh, has uh, Amazon CloudWatch so that you can monitor how the requests are going and uh, stuff. Um, so it sits between the uh, data, which is like your Lambda, Kinesis, or EC2. And uh, the applications, the client, uh, can access all this data through this interface. So what, uh, so what is the highlight is like, if you mean that uh, you have data and you're accessing the API Gateway, it means that it has to be secure. So API Gateway provides, uh, these are all the authorization op options you can provide. Um, so the IAM resource policies and Cognito and custom authorization, these are all the authorization options that are supported by API Gateway. The choice of using the authorization options depends on your use case. So ideally, if you are uh, living in a system outside of AWS, or like if you have multiple software components interacting with each other, uh, the custom authorization with the uh, AWS Lambda function makes sense. Uh, the All the others are, are actually tied to AWS system, uh, like IAM and resource policies. So in, today we will just see how we can use Auth0 as an authorization server um, uh, to secure the API. So what are we going to build today is like, first I'll create a Lambda. Uh, so that's the resource that we're going to protect uh, via securing the API. So I'll connect the Lambda to the API gateway. Uh, we'll create two Lambdas so that we'll know like how uh, the secure versus the unsecure uh, API gateway works uh, looks like. And then uh, we'll create an authorizer Lambda. Uh, and then we protect one of the resource path like we saw in the Gmail like, uh, uh, let's say we say create user and then say uh, get user, then we can protect one of the resource using the auth zero authorizer lambda. Uh, though I, I, it's like uh, it's too much uh, explaining of the things, it's actually the implementation part is very easy. So what I'm going to do is like directly uh, go into the AWS console and then quickly build stuff. Um, I just open the AWS API Gateway. Uh, if you're not seeing the screen, just uh, let me know. So what I'll do is like, uh, for the sake of use, uh, EC, so I'll, what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to use the existing uh, Lambda functions that are available. So what I'll do is like create a Lambda, use a blueprint, um, say get users or zero webinar. Um, it has some data, so I'm just going to pick some, whatever I have. That's it. I need to create the function to update the code. Just starting the uh, 
like while creating the function will take some time because it has to create the roles and the necessary permissions to invoke the Lambda function. Once it is done, it should be easy. So I'm going to update uh, the code. So what it basically means is like, if you invoke this Lambda function, you will just get a message. Um, I'm going to deploy it. Okay, so I've created the first Lambda function. I'm going to test it. So what I'll do is I get this. Okay, so it's working. Uh, so we'll go back and then I'll create uh, another function. What's the good friend? Um, okay. Say create user. The Lambda is basically is your actual data. So you can actually connect to the database, can fetch your CloudWatch logs and stuff. But I just wanted to keep it simple. So that's why I didn't add much. Uh, feel free to connect to your data and then you know fetch it. So I'm going to deploy this change. To quickly test it. Uh, There are two ways to test it, I think. Uh, this is the easy way. Okay, so yeah, we got the results anyway. So our, both the Lambda functions are okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is like create the API gateway. Uh, as simple as that, um, just create an API. Uh, as I mentioned, like Amazon API gateway provides the provision uh, to create a HTTP API, WebSocket, REST, and this is a private API. Um, so we are just focusing on REST and I'm just taking the public API. So I'll say build. Let's say all zero webinar REST API. I'm just going to leave everything as such. Okay, here comes the part. So like I mentioned, the API gateway has resources and we have to define the method. So uh, what I'm going to do is like, I have to define two resources, uh, say create user and then like create and then maybe list. And then I'm going to connect it to the Lambda. So first I have to create a resource and then call it get user. And this is my resource path. So I'm just keep it simple. So let's say get, um, creating this resource. Currently, it is not connected to any of the stuff. Now I'm going to hook it to the uh, the met, uh, the lambda. So what I'm going to do is like in the get resource, I'm going to create a method. I'm going to call like get, and now it's ask it asked me like what kind of integration I wanted to set up for the API gateway. Uh, so I'm going to use the lambda function and maybe integration. And now I have to find the lambda function. So get users or the webinar is the one we created. Uh, and then I click on save. It just ask, asking me that I'm going to give permission for the API because we are connecting it together. It's asking me like, do you want to give the permission for API gateway? Say, okay. Uh, so we have done the connection between the get request and the Lambda. So you have one path uh, like in the, there, this auth is called authorization. Like, do you have any authorization set up? Currently, we don't have. We haven't set up anything, so it shows none. And then I set a proxy for the lambda. Uh, this is optional. Like, if you want to transform the request to what goes to lambda and what comes out of it, uh, you can just set up the integration request. I prefer to have uh, the uh, formatted data going between the lambda, so I used the lambda proxy. So now it's connected. There's a quick way to test it. So what it's done is like, uh, you're accessing the API. So just say, test it. So yeah, you're actually calling the get user Lambda, so which works. Um, 
going to quickly create another resource. So let's say create and then now I have to add the method. So what I'm going to do is like create method. Uh, this time I'm going to say post. Uh, okay, now again, I have to set up the Lambda function, which Lambda function I want to integrate. Uh, also create this. Now I'll say create user, save, same step, done. I can test it quickly. Uh, I, it's not accepting any post method, so uh, you can just click test. So now it says like user created successfully, which means that the integration part is done, which is working. Uh, for the API gateway, this is just one first step. We have to actually deploy these APIs to make it available uh, as an API, uh, HTTP API. So what I'm going to do is like, uh, I've created the resource, I'm going to deploy the API. Uh, so we had to mention which stage you want to deploy. I'm going to call it fraud. Uh, okay, so only when you deploy these changes, uh, it will be available. So for example, uh, I don't have any resource until this, so let's say I get, so you can see the, you get the response as get. If you want to have, look at the value of put, which is already deployed, uh, I'm just going to make a quick curl call. Sorry. Yeah. So now the integration works perfectly. Um, the last step, which is like we have done the integration. Now everybody can use the API gateway. Like Tim mentioned, anybody can do a bot attack or anybody can access this API because it's public. Uh, so uh, it's better uh, to secure the API. So what we're going to do is like uh, start um, securing this API. We have an option called authorizer. So in here you had to create an authorizer. As I already mentioned, authorizer is rather lambda, wherein you have to mention like how the uh, the token that you receive or the authorization value that uh, uh, the authorization at uh, the access token, how this is going to be processed and how it's going to get evaluated. I'm going to quickly show you the code because uh, I thought it would take some time. So I've already deployed the, uh, the Lambda, which does the authorization part. So this is going to be the authorization Lambda. Um, so this will receive the token and then verifies uh, whether the token is valid or not. Uh, basically, it actually uses the JWKS endpoint to verify whether the uh, uh, the key is valid or not. Uh, this code is available in our Auth0 GitHub, but I can also share it. Uh, so it will actually basically check like uh, if the document is valid, like if the key is valid. Uh, let's say for example, you have a access token uh, from Auth0 or any IT provider, and you pass through this authorizer, um, it, it will actually check with the uh, um, authorization server whether that particular token is issued by that uh, authorization server. So it, it get you have a, a series of validation like uh, it checks for the signature of that particular token. It gets the public key from the authorization server. Uh, so all these things are done here. Just verifies whether the token is done or not. Um, once it is done, like let's say the key is valid, uh, you are getting, you're going to get a, a valid uh, IAM policy returned. If not, then it will say like the, if it, there is an error or uh, the token is not a valid token. Um, there is one thing that we have to do is like, there are a couple of environment variables. I'm going to show you quickly the Lambda. This is my authorization Lambda. I created a generic Lambda so that uh, you can change to any um, Auth0 application. So it takes uh, three environment variables. One is like which API you're going to protect. That's called an audience. And then uh, there is a JWK's URL. And then this is a token issuer. I'll show you how I grab this data from the Auth0 application dashboard. 
So log into your Auth0 tenant. Uh, basically, you will see this page, like a home page. So go to your applications. Uh, me. So whenever you wanted to uh, secure the API, the first step is to create an API. So just create an API and then say, uh, Auth0 webinar. API and then get the endpoint. So I'm going to use this. It can be any URL. So I'm just going to use generic uh, so that any resource under this audience can be, otherwise it will strictly match. So I'm going to use this. Uh, then you create an API. Once you create this API, uh, you get some client ID and identifier and then how long this, to uh, this token is valid by the, uh, just created by this application and stuff. So I'm just going to leave this at the moment because we have to come back and get the value. Uh, so the identifier, as I mentioned, is this, the audience. So what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to quickly directly change it, uh, the value. I have to make sure that I use the right identifier. So I'll grab it from the dashboard and then I update it. It's done. And the JWK's URL and the token issuer are mostly uh, the common if it's the same tenant. So I am using the tenant pradipa.odzero.com and it the JWK's JSON is normally the same, like your tenant name underscore well known or dot JSON. So this JSON will have your public key and stuff. So you can go to jwt.io and then uh, sorry, JSON lint and then see what all the values it has. Um, and then uh, the, the token issuer. So I'm using the uh, my tenant. So I'm using the token issuer. So once this is all done, I'm going to save. Now this a auth zero a auth lambda will respect only the access token coming from this API because I've changed it. So what I'm going to do is like. Uh, create this authorizer now. Since it's already deployed, it should work. So I'm just gonna quickly test it. So. I have this token grabbed from something else, like it's not from the current application. So if I'm going to test this Lambda, it will fail, hopefully, yeah. So it says like, uh, it's not a valid token. If you look at the logs, it says like it received this token, and then say uh, there, there was an error saying that this token is not a valid. Let's say I'm going to use the proper token associated with the API which I created. So if you go to the test tab, normally you can find a some sample access token. I'm going to grab this token and just want to test whether my authorization Lambda works. So this is my event JSON. So this is my authorization token. I'm going to save it so that I don't lose it. Just make sure the JSON is a correct format. Okay, now I'm going to test it. So if you see this, uh, I have updated the Lambda for that particular audience. So when I grab the token, uh, it says success. If you see the response, uh, this authorization Lambda is giving me a principal ID and then it's, it says like I have the uh, authorization to invoke any API, um, but you have to restrict it. But I have just mentioned like I can in invoke any API. Uh, so my authorization works. What I have to do is, is the last part. It's like go to your API gateway and connect your uh, the authorization Lambda, which is meant for your API gateway. Um, so I have to create this authorization and say, let's say Auth0, webinar authorizer and then it should show me the list of a lambda i'm going to choose my authorization lambda 
so we are going to use uh, token based authorization uh, so i'm going to say token and then the token source will be uh, the value will uh, the header will come as authorization it can be anything you just have to mention it in your code um, if you want to do the validation of the token for before even evaluating you can add it like if you want the token to have bearer with some number uh, with symbols then you can validate it um, otherwise it, before even invoking it will just validate whether the token is coming with the proper uh, specification i'm just going to create it and say grant and create it uh, so now our lambda is working i just want to test whether uh, the authorization part is working so let me say test what i have to do is like add the token and see whether uh, my token is working so i'm going to grab it again now we are testing it independently we have not tied the authorizer with any api gateway i'm just making sure everything is working so i'm getting the response which means that uh let me check. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting the policy code. For example, let's say you mentioned something and then say test, that will fail. Uh, so, okay, we are good. The last and final step is to connect this authorizer with the particular uh, stage. So, if you see here, I'm going to quickly refresh it. Sometimes the authorizer will not show it in the drop down. So we have two methods, post and get. So I'm going to just update uh, the authorization of the get uh, to the authorizer. So click on edit. So it will show one of the, it will show only in the drop down only when you add it. So otherwise it will not show. So now what I'm going to do is like, I'm enabling the uh, token based authorization for only the post. Okay, it's done. Um, so it's enabled. Let's come to get, uh, there's none. I'm just going to leave it just to show the difference between these two. So now what happens is like uh, our, our API gateway is secure with the authorizer uh, and it is connected to our author, uh, auth zero and server. So what happens is like when you don't have a proper access token issued by the auth zero, uh, then you, you don't have, you cannot access this API. I'm going to quickly show you in the terminal. Let me clear it. So as we know, uh, let me grab the value. So I have to, if you remember, I have to pass it as authorization header and then, uh, and I mean, you have to pass it in the header as authorization. So I'm going to grab the EP token once again. Is it for me to call it? Now, this is not my request. Yeah, I'm missing something. I'll tell you what, it will not work. I'm not sure if you can guess why. Hmm. I don't know. I have to deploy the API. Uh, Let's say I've added the authorizer, but I've never deployed it. So currently it's not secure. So if you just curl without the, it will work. Why? So let's say curl and then press this. It will work. See, it's working. You know what? Because I have, I made all the changes. I never deployed those changes. We actually tested it only on stage by stage. Uh, so only now, like once, so that's the part. So only now we have to, uh, the API which you attach to the authorizer is available. So now if you just do a curl, it will not work. I don't know why. It will take some time. Okay. 
it takes some time to refresh. Uh, so ideally, what you have to do is like uh, pass this in the authorization header, and then you do a create, then it will work. Otherwise, it will fail. Uh, as the other one, which we have not attached to the, I'm going to deploy again. I'm not sure whether I deployed all the resources. There is a problem. Sometimes it will deploy only the specific resource. Um, Now, uh, what happens is like our get, okay, I'm in the wrong one. This is my webinar. If I use the correct, I haven't deployed the correct word. Okay, I just do one more deployment because I was at the wrong path. Yeah, just now it's reflecting because I was deploying the wrong one. Uh, so, it means like I'm just making a dark curl without the header. It doesn't work. It says unauthorized. Now I'm going to update, call the same with a header, with a token. Now it says created successfully. And our gate is always works because I think, because we never secure. So let's see. It always works, but you don't need the header anymore. Um, I think that's all we have uh, for the demo. And I have a few things to share uh, on what's happening under the hood of. So what we saw was uh, very simple things, but there are a lot of things that are going underneath, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so I this is what we built today. One is like your client, I'm using the browser terminal, but it could be from your mobile application or any IoT devices. We had an access token from our Auth0 anti-server, which we provides an access token. And we grabbed the token and then we sent the token along with the request. And the dotted line is what we have built. So we have an API gateway that was connected to the Lambda and we have a, a JWT authorizer that is also connected to API gateway. And before even it connects to the Lambda or your data resource, it checks whether the token that has been sent by the client is valid or not. Um, so this is the overall picture. Let's see what happens in step-by-step. Step. Uh, so what's like the first one is like, we have a request, we have the token that is sent to the API gateway. The second is like this token is sent to the authorizer. Uh, so the Lambda, which we have written, does the, uh, verification of the JWT part. It has to talk to your uh, zero authorization server. That's why we have to give the tenant names and the JWK's uh, signature uh, URL. So once the token is verified, uh, so it talks to the server. Uh, so once the token is verified, only then the API gateway will track, talk to the Lambda. If there is any problem with this or the token being like uh, the signature is not uh, correct or this token is not valid, then what happens is like it will deny and then it never makes a request to the Lambda. So assuming that this token is legit, so uh, the API gateway makes a request to the Lambda and that's why we get the responses like the user created successfully response. And this response is sent to the client. The API gateway has the function to format the response based on the client. Um, and that's all about that. And I'm going to ask Peter if you have any questions from the audience. And thank you so much. Thank you, Pradeepa. Uh, thank you, Tim, uh, for both of you. Excellent presentations. Uh, you, and we do, in fact, uh, have a few questions uh, from the audience. So uh, if you can. Um, 
well, if you can help out, that would be great. So the first question comes from uh, Matthew, and his question is, do we have any examples or documentation on implementing token exchange using an API gateway? Um, and that one to either Tim or Pradeepa. Uh, I can take that question. We do have a, a documentation on securing API gateway using Auth0. Uh, I can, if you want, you can just drop a note or I will drop the resources uh, in the chat. Cool. Yes, if you could do that, Pradeepa, I think uh, that would be great if we have any links to that. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, uh, Matthew, and Pradeepa will follow up on that. Uh, next question is from Thomas. Uh, we're using a similar setup and our front end requests a few REST resources upon loading. This spawns multiple lambdas, and I've seen some network latency when loading the JWKS.json obviously as it's an HTTP request to a remote data center. Is there a best or at least a good practice to verify token signatures in a serverless environment without loading JWKS JSON from network on every load? For example, caching in ephemeral storage and also how should that cache be refreshed? Uh, I can take this question as well. Uh, since it's a network a latency and stuff, what you can do is like the primary uh, reason of uh, contacting between the JWKS is to verify the signature. So you can actually download the signature and you can cache it in your local storage. And uh, Lambda has an ephemeral storage, as you mentioned. So I can use it in your P, uh, .pem file in your uh, file. In, it's a, since it's a public key, you can store it. And uh, you can get that data and then uh, do the verification. Uh, there might be SDKs that support, like like which I have shown is like directly call the JWKS JSON and then resolve it and verify the signature. You just have to look for a SDK that supports uh, looking for the uh, the public key in your cache system. I'm sure that that should be done. Uh, it should not take much time. Yeah, or in, in, in general, I mean, there's two different ways on how you can validate the access token. Um, one of them is to send the access token to the introspec endpoint. I guess that is the approach that you currently use where you send the access token each time to um, the introspec. Um, the other one, um, as mentioned, is that you can also cache the key within your application and then you... Uh, don't have to do those external calls every time. So as long as the access token is weighted and part of that access token is a claim that tells you how long it's weighted, I think typically like an hour or so, um, that means you don't have to validate a token within um, that hour to make sure it's still weighted. Cool, excellent. Thank you for uh, that question. Uh, next question is, can I use C++ or is it only Java that's supported? Uh, this is for which language support? Uh, do you mean the custom authorizer? I'm not sure, I've just got a, um, I don't know if you can uh, have any update on that question or can, add some additional context to that. Uh, certainly Auth0, I can answer from the authorization server perspective. Um, Auth0 is an authorization server and it follows uh, industry standard for OpenID Connect and OAuth2. And there are a number of endpoints that we provide as APIs. So you can actually call the Auth0 authorization server from any language. Um, it doesn't have to be um, Java or JavaScript or any particular language. It is open uh, to anything. And hopefully yeah. that um, does that. And question. since it's a Lambda function to build the authorizer, so AWS Lambda supports uh, all, most of the languages, even from PHP, Java, C, Swift, and stuff. So don't think there is any limitation with the language here. Yeah, yeah and, okay. and if the... Uh, if the target application is written within C++. So that's typically the case when you have a desktop application, then there's different SDKs like the Qt framework, which allows you 
to uh, host a website within your own application. And by adding Authero to that um, application, you basically show a browser and that browser window, the full flow of authenticating the user and so on happens. And then when the user is successfully authenticated, um, you uh, redirect basically back to your C++ application to get the um, access token. And that's at least what I saw when um, a customer was having an, a Java application. Um, cool, thank you, Tim. Uh, okay, we've got a couple of more minutes left and a couple more questions, so that, that works quite well. Um, Frederico, his question is, how does the authorizer check the token? Does it call slash introspect? Uh, could you call Tim and um, take on? Yeah, it calls the introspect that uh, uh, since we answered the last question, so it calls the JWKS endpoint. Uh, so that's how the authorizer verifies the token. Cool. Um, one last question from David. I have a question about the JWT authorizer. Is the code on GitHub the code of the authorizer? Uh, is it? Uh, it's a Lambda, isn't it? Uh, a Lambda authorizer, I presume. Yeah. Uh, so what I have, the code which I have written is in serverless framework. I just uh, showed it from the console so that you know what resources you are using. Uh, so it's in the GitHub, it's in my GitHub. So you can visit uh, Pradeepa P and I will share the GitHub links. Uh, yeah, my repository. Cool, excellent. Thank you, Pradeepa. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Pradeepa, and we'll wrap up. Uh, the webinar. We've got some upcoming events. I'm going to post uh, some links now into the chat window. Um, and these are some upcoming events we've got on um, zero integration and uh, kind of on our, our hands on lab that we do. And if you could go to the next slide um, as well, please, Pradeepa, um, then you can also, I dropped a link as well into the chat window previously, and you can sign up uh, to our Zero Index newsletter, which will give you additional development-based hints, tips, and tricks all around um, security. So it just leaves me really to say thank you, everybody, uh, for joining today. Thank you, Pradeepa. Thank you, Tim, for two excellent presentations. And of course, thank you um, to everybody who's joined and made this webinar possible. So thank you all. Take care. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.